Welcome to episode 73 of Talking Dairy. The agricultural sector is evolving the water quality conversation from a focus on contaminant concentrations such as nitrogen to a more holistic assessment of stream condition that includes what's living and growing in streams. There are many environmental indicators or attributes as they're called in the 2020 National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management, which includes important aquatic life like stream bugs, also known as macroinvertebrates, and native fish. Today we're joined by Dairy NZ Principal Scientist Dr Craig Dupree, whose role is focused on the science of water quality and using this science to help farmers make positive change on farm. We'll be talking to Craig about taking an ecosystem health approach for waterways, what the benefits are and why he's an advocate for this holistic approach. I'm today's host, Jack McGowan. Kia ora, Craig. Thanks for joining us today. Before we get into the science, I'd like to hear about how you got into science yourself. What's your background and how did you become interested in water quality? I did a PhD in chemistry because I wanted to just copy my brother and show him I could beat him in everything that he did. So I ended up with a PhD when I did that. My PhD was in chemistry and it wasn't until a couple of postdocs that were unrelated to the environment that eventually I got a job at NIWA. So no real underlying passions. It was kind of getting a job and that job was at NIWA. And that started then the uh, the very big dive into the environment, starting with urban runoff. But I've also looked at anti natural product, marine products for anti-fouling. And so slowly moved toward 18 years at NIWA. And that's when you sort of moved more into the national policy statement, freshwater management. And uh, I've been seconded to MFE and I've worked on development of some of the attributes that we're sort of struggling with today. Thank you, Craig. So that's interesting to hear that your passion for water quality came out of the work and the education rather than born in you. How did you grow up? On farm? Off farm? Oh, no, I'm I'm a total townie. Born in Kirikiriroa, but my hometown where I grew up is Tokoroa. And then after finishing high school at Forest View High School, it was pretty much left uh, and did all my degrees, BSc, MSc, PhD at uh, Waikato University. And then I postdoced at Massey University, postdoced at Otago University. I've always lived in around the uh, the Waikato catchment. So that's what I feel most affiliated to. So we're here to talk about a more holistic approach to waterway health. Can you explain what that is and why it's important to you? Holistic is in the sense of the whole of the ecosystem. So from my interpretation of, of what holism is, I tend to be thinking that's more about what communities and, and you know, farmers are part of communities, of course, and productive catchments. And so it's what communities are actually kind of seeking when they say they want to have better water quality. They're normally talking about that stream providing more for the stream life that lives in it. You know, just as I guess we human dwellers, you know, want to have a, you know, when we talk about the health of us, we're, we're generally talking about how well we're going. And so I think the holism and uh, holistic measures of stream health is when we're thinking about the things that do live or should live in the stream and, and then trying to provide for those organisms. So that's kind of what I sort of think of as holism as opposed to, I guess, the, the converse of that, of reductionism, you know, where you then try and think about contaminants, you know, that might be what sort of level of contaminants do we need to provide for the stream life? So focusing on potential driver as opposed to the outcome. So that's my view of, of holism anyway. Is this a shift for the sector? I think it's a shift for science, whereas I don't think it's really a shift for communities, really. Like I say, when people are thinking of what they want to know about or what is, if they've got a healthy stream, I think the outcomes have always been, you know, in people's minds, at least, or or what they're wanting to achieve or what does good look like has always involved holism, you know, thinking about what should be in the stream. Whereas the mechanics of science and regulation has had to go to reductionism because you have to look at levers you can control because it's really complex as to how ecological systems and holism, all these things respond to all the sort of nerdy word, multiple stresses that are sort of involving when we sort of go from native land cover to a modified landscapes. There's lots of pressures there. So we don't know how all those things pan out, but uh, it's because we need to have a, I guess, some regulatory comfort. We like to then sort of think of this lever here with nutrients on it, this lever here with sediment on it, we pull on those. So from a regulatory perspective, I think the big thing that changed was in 2020 in the NPSFM when some of these 
what we'd call these more holistic or ecological response attributes came into the NPSFM and that kind of really forced a bit more of a rethink. They became compulsory things to measure and compulsory things to manage. So we're now looking at now the direct measures of these stream organisms. So I think people have always wanted these holistic measures. That's what success has looked like to them. It's taken maybe a while for the science and hopefully regulation to sort of um, be now shifting maybe more that way. Speaking of people, you mentioned before we started recording that you were out in the field yesterday, maybe with your waders on. Tell me about that. Who were you with and what were you up to? We were out with uh, the Pōkai Whenua Catchment Group and uh, Raukawa, which is the iwi in, in Tokoroa, and that's part of a uh, MFE-funded Jobs for Nature project that we have there. And that's kind of a real good example of a project where we had to put down our calculators and our, <laughs> you know, our sort of, you know, thinking about sort of science and what we might need to be doing and for those reducing contaminants and then initially at least focusing on the stream health, you know, what fish are in the streams, what taonga species are in the sort of streams. And so so as part of that work, uh, we were actually, the specifics of what we were sort of doing yesterday was looking at the potential for having more tuna ponds within farming landscapes where you can build ponds. I mean, quite often we'll have duck ponds for duck shooting, but those can actually be useful habitats to improve the number of taonga species and, ha- and provide habitat for some of these fish. So we were doing some work there with a Frenchman actually, an ex-knee with uh, chap Jacques Boubet. Uh, so he was there and we were sort of collecting these eels. We're trapping and then uh, measuring the eels, doing some things to age those eels. So that's what we're doing again in this holism sort of theme about like uh, wanting to improve habitat or improve the numbers of eels, especially because we have the hydro dam. So this catchment, eels can't can no longer get into this catchment. So they have to be moved up from the dams. But then even then with the removal of sort of a lot of the you know, modifications of the landscape to farm, they've lost a lot of habitat. So that that's what we're sort of looking at in the community project within that catchment to sort of look at how we can enhance tuna habitat. So good couple of days. Very good. And of course, a holistic approach to waterway health would be nothing new to Rokawa. Yeah, no, and they, they have a, a reasonably new cultural assessment framework and it's Te Arohirohi. And even that is sort of even goes beyond what my <laughs> version of holism is because uh, talking to Joseph Karponga when he was explaining it to me, they talk about some assessments they want to do before the sun comes up because you actually don't want to be, you want to use your, you know, listen to the sounds of the water and listen to the sounds of the birds and nature sort of thing. So there's even things we can still keep learning there. And that's, and that's the beauty of that project is we're honestly, we're trying to sort of see where work that we can do if we're going to categorise that as more conventional or Western science, how that can sort of be useful for them. But then we're also trying to sort of learn the methods that are useful for them. And we've been on the banks of the river with uh, one of the Kaitiaki Aiden, Ricky Takanawa. And, uh, you know, everyone's just amazed just when they're doing Tokoda monitoring with bracken bundles and going into the Whakauru stream to retrieve these bundles and shaking them out and actually having coda. And that's what I mean. That's more what it's about. That is sort of the holism, thinking about what's in the stream. And I guess a lot of it too, that holism, the beauty of it is that that's when you're trying to connect people to streams, you're going to connect people to streams or their local waterways, I think a lot more effectively through those type of means when you're talking about, you know, fish, eels, tuna, coda, you know, rather than talking about a level of turbidity or the, the mix per litre of a particular contaminant. Those are still important, but, you know, we still have to have them in the context that um, there's other things, that we, and we'll get onto that later, you know, about how we can be driving for improvements in, uh, in stream health. Yeah, yeah. Numbers are certainly not as exciting. They remind me of being in, in science class at school, which was fun, but um, they're not nearly as exciting as tuna and coda. If someone was interested in measuring waterway health in a more holistic way, what would you recommend for them to do? There's a new method that's based on DNA. Uh, and so DNA is very specific to the organism and uh, seems weird, but we're always, all organisms are shedding DNA. So certainly if you're something that lives in a stream, then when you shed DNA, it's in the stream. You can even have birds, aquatic birds, they shed DNA into waterways, uh, trees that even overhang, so riparian margins, you know, you can have rain that leaches DNA off the leaves and puts in the stream or even just leaf material falling in there. So you basically have a mechanism to anything that gets DNA into the stream and then you take a water sample and then that water sample gets analysed and then all those organisms, plants, microbes, mammals, you know, fish. So you might get four to, you know, several hundred organisms that are sort of found in there. And so although there'll be a lot of things we maybe 
you know, we're not that interested in. But the important ones is when, you know, even though sometimes as scientists like myself, you get a bit excited about macroinvertebrates and, and stream insects, but even then we find when we really talk into the community, it's, you know, it seems like coda and fish, they just sort of really relate and people instantly connect if they have a stream and you tell them that they've got long fin tuna or a short jaw kokapu, you know, sort of which is a threatened species in that stream. It, that, that's probably the biggest thing that really um, resonates with people about the value of that of that pastoral stream. You know, they might have thought their perception may have been that it was quite low value. It was a farm stream or it could even, they might be calling it a farm drain. But, you know, when they sort of see that it's supporting that kind of life in there, then that, that's what then encourages them, I think, to connect with that waterway and start to sort of think, oh, if that's valuable, maybe uh, they then take that next step about thinking about, you know, might be riparian sort of planting. But, yeah, EDNA has been the thing that's uh, really opened that up for catchment groups, uh, for people, you know, even a scientist like myself, because prior to that, if you want to look for fish, You'd have to get a freshwater ecologist to set nets or do electric fishing for things like macroinvertebrates. You'd have to again get a freshwater ecologist, go into the stream, catch things, and then um, get them sent off. And it would be quite expensive, you know. Whereas, whereas EDNAs now allows people to basically stick a sample in the water, sits there for overnight, and then you just uh, send it into a lab, and then you get a whole list of um, organisms that are in the stream, and then also it gives you an overall indication of stream health based on all those things that have been found that will tell you, you know, is it poor, average, good, excellent type sort of thing. So that's it's quite a sort of powerful progression of science, especially in that space of holism. You know, it's out now allowed us to to say, hey, this is where we should be looking. Uh, but now we've got a tool that we can actually sort of say it's not gold plated. You know, there's actually a cost effective way in which for people to sort of um, be looking more holistically at what's in their stream. So that's kind of been the real big thing for us here at Dairy and Z, and I'm sure even regional councils, because with the, it was actually the 2020 MPCFM that required compulsory fish monitoring that actually drove, I think, a lot of the technology to sort of get ways in which they could actually be measuring these important things in streams. So, so the same way in which councils are using this, we've now got access to it, catchment groups, farmers. What does it cost? How, how accessible is it? Less than $300. It was about $280 for a comprehensive test that it, captures all these, you know, several hundred organisms and gives you a stream health one. And I think one of the beauties too is that yeah, when you send it in, you actually get your sample comes back in, in the form of a dot on a map. You know, you click on that dot and it brings it up and then you can explore the information that was in there, sort of even little pretty little biodiversity wheels so you can kind of see where the fish, the birds, you know, type sort of thing. So it's, so it's quite... From our experience, it's resonated a lot more with farmers and and certainly with Rokawa, you know, sort of thing when we're trying to sort of initially engage there. It's like, you know, if you talk about contaminants, they go, what does that mean? But but as soon as you say you have, you know, these fish or something like that, and I'm saying it's always a good news story, you sometimes get, you don't have any of the things that you hoped were in there, but it still provides that sort of holistic measure and you can start to go from there. But quite often it actually, what we're sort of finding is that, uh, there's always aquatic life in the stream, even in the ones streams that were rated as not great. They still were one of the few that had, you know, enunga and long fin tuna in these streams or something. So there was still something to grab onto to say, hey, this is still a valuable stream. Something there that's worth protecting and providing for. Oh, absolutely. Yep. We did some eDNA sampling with a group of students here in the Waikato, Hamilton Junior Naturalists, teenagers. It was amazing, like they loved getting in the water and setting it up, like that really appealed to their their need for physical activity and, and connecting to water. They don't get the opportunity to do that much. But then getting the results back, it was so cool seeing not just what was living in the water, but also what was living near the water. So there's a lot of goats in the bush around that stream. So we could see that come through in the eDNA profile. You know, when you sort of see eels being caught in traps and you see someone taking a 1.3 metre long fin eel out, even though you've got eDNA saying you've got that, again, if you're really trying to connect people with, that's what I was saying about Tokoda monitoring, or, you know, just having those, uh, even just a you know, freshwater crayfish, it's amazing just what it means when you actually sort of see them in a bucket and these are the things that are living in the stream. So, so it is great to see it through eDNA and not all of us have time to get out on streams and start and, and putting out nets and all that type of thing or electric fish. But but yeah, it, it, again, it takes it up even another level when you can actually sort of physically connect or, or you know see these organisms in the stream. But it's a really good middle ground there that does uh, the eDNA, you know, being able to sort of say, do I have these in here? Yes, you do. 
And so uh, once we have the results of our eDNA testing, then what? Like what do farmers or communities need to do to protect the taonga that they identify there? You can categorise some of the actions as either mitigative or restorative. So sometimes regulations are always about the mitigative, trying to reduce the negative drivers, you know, sort of thing and contaminants, and that's still important. But the one where it's a little bit more silent on and becomes more in the voluntary spaces, and it's seen by a lot of studies to be the major thing that actually can enhance the health of streams, and that's actually restoring riparian restoration because the loss of shade is one of the biggest things that actually degrade waterways because once you've lost shade, you have increased temperatures, increased sunlight to the bed, more weeds, less dissolved oxygen, and dissolved oxygen is critical. Uh, temperature and um, dissolved oxygen are these sort of critical life-supporting sort of functions that the, if you're going to live in a stream, you can't have water too hot. And then, of course, just like us, if we we're in a room, with no oxygen, we wouldn't do too well. And it's the same in streams. If you have things wrong, too much plant growth, the oxygen can get pulled out of the stream uh, during the evening. So, so in terms of what you can do, it's enhancing the habitat. And the single biggest action that I guess you can do to enhance habitat to improve stream health is to plant preferably native riparian stuff because of the the shading, the cooling, the bank protection, all those benefits uh, have been shown since, you know, geez, there's been big volumes written in 1995 for the Department of Conservation on, and NIWA research, you know, some of the single biggest benefits you can have to improve stream health in rural streams is to reinstate the riparian margins. You know, you can have a disproportionate beneficial impact on the stream through planting that riparian area and reestablishing shade. We've obviously been fencing waterways and planting the riparian margin for some time. How far back from the water should we be fencing and planting if we're thinking about habitat rather than just meeting regulations? I'm always sort of thinking in the three to five metres. If I'm thinking about a reasonable size stream, you know, when we used to, with the stream accord, streams bigger than a metre or something like that, we used to call them significant streams, which the only problem with that is that then you're saying that smaller streams are insignificant, I guess, and they're all very significant streams. If it's in that case there, I think even in a, from a regulatory sense, sort of three metres tends to be fallen out as the absolute minimum. That's okay for that sort of width stream, but then you're probably, if your streams are getting wider, you'd be thinking about five metres. But normally at that stage, if a farmer's thinking about planting, then they would be starting to look at where the sort of the paddock drops off down to the stream and whether you know, you can, you know, there's just a more pragmatic place to be putting the fence. So it would be variable in that sense. Because, yeah, so regulatory minimums are quite tricky to deal with. So I would normally say three to five metres. But then on smaller streams, I think one of the, if we're talking about trying to improve uh, stream health, that's really just distilling down to providing shade for the stream. And and that general kind of rule of thumb is that, you know, you need a metre of height of vegetation for the same width of your stream is, you know, whatever your width of your stream is, that's the height of the vegetation you ideally would need on both sides of the bank. So I guess you're thinking about those species then and you'd be wanting to have enough room to be able to plant those streams. So the, so the wider your stream gets, the bigger the vegetation you'd be wanting to sort of have and provide for that. So that's always a tricky one. But when you're on small streams, you know, like the ones less than a metre and they could be those very small, you know, sort of intermittent streams that may be still a stream, but they might flow more in the in the winter and then and have a bit of a dry up in summer or something, but they're still important streams and drains. You know, you can sometimes get a, a metre and having carrots plants and, you know, type thing is, is enough to sort of provide shade and some bank side. So it is kind of, and I think the model for how to operate is, is probably Taranaki Regional Council. You know, they they jumped on this back in the 90s and they're 30 years into their riparian management plan. I think they've converted on a, can't remember what it is, three to 5,000 hectares of, of farmland have now converted to basically native bush through that riparian, through probably whatever it is. They want to eventually have uh, it's something like 7,000 kilometres of stream banks planted sort of thing. And, and they're the ones that then provide those sort of riparian plans, I guess, to provide for that. The wider you are, often, especially in, in catchments too, if you, if you do get those fences back a bit, you can then allow for a bit of stream bank movement because stream banks do break a little bit sort of thing, you know, especially if they've been straightened because then the stream's trying to reinstate a bit more of a meander. So, um, yeah, it's uh, three to five metres. You mentioned Taranaki started that 30 years ago. We're a bit slower off the mark up around here. How long does it take for actions such as reducing runoff, planting your stream banks to have an impact on what we might see in the life within the stream in the eDNA results? The thing about riparian planting is that, you know, obviously 
streams are very long, you know, from that whole sort of, you know, mountains to the sea type sort of thing. And so one of the important things more so than the width, it's the actually the longitudinal extent of shading that's actually been implemented because, uh, of course, the more you have shaded, and they always say it's better to start from the top, you know, the smaller streams and work down because, you know, then your shading's more efficient on those smaller streams. So, so at a small section of the stream, if you just planted that and it was an island in isolation from anything else, you'd still get the bank stability of that particular reach. But, you know, you probably wouldn't see an improvement or much of an improvement for a while in that little section because things like fish, they might hang out there because it's a nice spot. Like you might like we would go there for a picnic, but, you know, you don't, wouldn't live there type sort of thing, you know. So what we do know in terms of like when you do plant and shade, it's five to ten years, I think, to get those plants to grow up and then start to sort of shade and, and provide those benefits. Landowners, you know, they're often saying, you know, what do I do? So if we tell them to plant, that's how they should be assessed on on success. If they've been asked to implement something and they implement something, then that's what they can control. If a certain fish swims up there, great. If a certain swish or a certain fish within a certain time frame that we as humans have decided, you know, it should occur, but it doesn't, then farmers can't control that. But it's definitely when you look at Taranaki and you talk about uh, farmers' perceptions of the benefits from what they've done, you know, they still have that overwhelming feeling of the, you know, of stewardship, you know, you've got, you've massively increased, you know, that whole sort of 5,000 hectares of pastoral land going to native bush that they've got now these native ribbons running through their catchments, you know, and they said, you know, their social license to operate within that region because, because, you know, you've got the public driving around seeing these, you know, streams that are all sort of uh, fenced off with very aesthetically attractive, you know, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And and that's, you really can't sort of even underestimate some of those sort of non-stream benefits that even accrue from doing what I would say is the right thing. Well, that brings us to the end of our time today. Thank you so much for talking with us, Craig. It's easy to see that a holistic approach is, is the way to go. It's the one that feels more natural for us and it's more positive, focused on outcomes that we, we all want. So it's come through loud and clear from you that stream health is more than concentrations of contaminants and that eDNA thing, like that's a cool advance that makes it possible for us to directly measure one of the reasons we care about stream health, the critters within it. One of the key actions that you talked about to improve stream health is something we're already doing, planting the riparian zone to stabilise the bank and shade the water. I really can't wait to see where this goes and to learn more about the taonga that are hidden in our waterways. Mati wa noho oromai. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Talking Dairy. Check the show notes on where to go for more information on this topic. And if you have any ideas on future episodes, please send an email to talkingdairy at dairynz.co.nz.